It's good to have you back, my lord. Don't let him ask you about. My grand used to tell me stories about you lot. I've known your family for centuries. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things you missed in The Sandman. Caution, Princess Barbara. I sent strangeness in the air. What manner of thing, Martin Tenbone? The cuckoo? The hero mancer? Colonel Knowledge? For this list, we're looking at subtle details and references in the Netflix adaptation of Neil Gaiman's celebrated comic book series. Some of these required close attention, while others required a bit of knowledge from the source material and other comics. What details did you love in The Sandman? How did you like the first season? Let us know! Number 10. Dreaming Details But there is another life which awaits you when you close your eyes. and enter my realm. Dream's domain, the dreaming, is home to thousands of denizens, both dreams and nightmares. The opening scene of the series showcases this realm, from the Gates of Horn and Ivory, to Cain and Abel's Houses of Mystery and Secrets, to Dream's magnificent castle. When the waking world leaves you wanting and weary, sleep brings you here to find freedom and adventure. The name of the gates derives from a literary image that first appeared in Homer's Odyssey, playing on the similarities between the Greek words for horn and fulfill and ivory and deceive. We also catch brief glimpses of Martin Tenbones and Mervyn Pumpkinhead, who reappear in later episodes, voiced by the legendary Lenny Henry and Mark Hamill, respectively. Number 9. Starry-Eyed Among Morpheus's most iconic features in the comics, besides his wild, very 80s hair, are his eyes. Foregoing the humdrum of ordinary human eyeballs, the King of Dreams gazes out at the world through distant stars. Sandman creator Neil Gaiman, who serves as executive producer on the show, said that in pre-production tests, Contact lenses and CGI diminished the magic of Tom Sturridge's performance. The eyes convey a lot of emotion, helping to make Dream relatable. No mean feat given the abstract, metaphysical nature of the Endless. Having said that, there are a few shots where lights in his eyes reflect the star fields in which Dream stands. You destroyed the ruby and released the power inside it. I would never have thought of that. It's a nice nod to his appearance in the comics. Number 8. Matthew's Origins Do you know who I am? Not entirely, but I, I don't even know who I am anymore. A couple hours ago I apparently died in my sleep and now I'm, I'm a bird. Neil Gaiman cites Alan Moore's Swamp Thing as having gotten him back into comics in his 20s, and Moore's influence pervades the Sandman. In fact, when Matthew the Raven mentions that he wasn't always a dream, he's referring to his life in Swamp Thing. If I were Joanna Constantine, I'd be up there cutting a deal with Rachel to keep the sand, then cut the dream sand with real sand and sell it to the highest bidder. But then I wasn't the best person when I was a person. As investigator Matthew Cable, he suffered damage to his mind that allowed him to alter reality leading him down a dark path. He ended up in a coma and chose to end his life. John Constantine, who appears in the Sandman comics, also originated in the pages of Swamp Thing. In the Netflix adaptation, Joanna takes his place, with a similar backstory involving Astra and the same exes. They even called your exes? He did not. Which ones? Sarah? Oliver. Oh, shit. I'm Kit Ryan. Her ancestor, Lady Joanna Constantine, was created by Gaiman for the Sandman comics. Number 7. Apocalypse Live. I don't think it is you. I think it's him. Does the news seem darker these days? Well, it certainly is on The Sandman. As John Dee uses the ruby to wreak havoc in the diner, the world outside begins to fall apart. Even a feel-good fluff piece on the news takes a sour turn. The presenter announces that after 10 years together, 
captive pandas have mated. A real story, by the way, from April 2020, although the pandas have different names. However, she unexpectedly segues into a cynical polemic against procreation. Reports are that the pandas, Bao Lin and Pai Yao, have mated after a decade-long courtship effort by zoo staffers. Personally, I don't blame them for not wanting to procreate since there are two of only about 2,000 pandas in existence on this fucked planet. We later hear about a wave of violence, traffic pileups, plane crashes, and other tragedies. The diner is a microcosm of the carnage in the wider world. No wonder the three saw fit to appear, prophesying through the women in the diner. You tell me my future. There is no future for you, John D. It is bound by walls and guards and the sour smell of madness. And then the skein of your life is cut, son of your mother. Number six, hunting grounds. Where do you hunt? I have a great place. There are thousands of people there. Funland is a particularly creepy character with a monstrous predilection. There are chilling hints about where he finds his victims, described as a place with rides and thousands of kids. He claims to have met the voice actor behind The Big Bad Wolf, a character who's featured in numerous Disney animations. Actually got to meet him once. You met The Big Bad Wolf? The actor who did the voice. Wow. In the comics, he also professes his love for the song It's a Small World, which plays in Fantasyland at various Disney parks. The ears on his hat might be pointed and wolfish rather than round, but we're pretty sure we know what Gaiman was getting at. That's really dark. Kevin Smith actually brought Funland back for the limited series Batman The Widening Gyre. Number 5. Shaxbird if Bill and Ted had a literature assignment, they'd do well to just follow Hob Gadling through history. In the year 1389, when Hob first encounters Dream, a man is singing the praises of William Langland's allegorical narrative poem, Pierce Plowman, to his friend, Geoffrey. Pierce Plowman, that's what people want, Geoffrey, not filthy tales in rhyme about pilgrims. But Edmund, I enjoy rhyming. And I enjoy tavern tales told of an evening. That's actually Geoffrey Chaucer, renowned author of the Canterbury Tales. In 1589, the inn's visitors include Kit and Will Shaxbird. Well, Kit, your theme as I saw it is this. That for one's art and for one's dreams, one may consort and bargain with the darkest powers. Kit was the nickname of Dr. Faustus author Christopher Marlowe. Shaxbird, of course, turns out to be Shakespeare. So why Shaxbird? Well, his contemporary spelled his name dozens of ways, and Shaxbird was one of them. By the way, listen attentively and you'll notice that the same conversations are recurring across time periods. That's just bloody politics. There's going to be a revolution. Get dressed to get to the shop when they can make more adults. You can't escape death, taxes, and apparently, sneaky vicars. Number four, an ironic symbol. At the end, I'm there with them. I'm holding their hand and they're holding mine. Just like in the comics, death wears a surprising symbol around her neck. It's an ankh, an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic symbol that actually means life. The Ankh is also seen in Desire's Residence, The Threshold, and Dream's Castle. I stand in my gallery and I hold your sigil. The other sigils are Destiny's Book, Dream's Helm, Desire's Glass Heart, or Mirror in Her Own Dwelling, Despair's Hooked Ring, and Delirium's Swirl of Colors. The missing sigil belongs to Dream's younger brother, Destruction, referred to as the Prodigal, because like the prodigal son in Jesus' parable, he's abandoned his home and responsibilities. Number three, Serial Convention. It's a serial convention. I thought there'd be serial. You can forgive Jed for thinking a serial convention would be all about breakfast. The attendees describe themselves as collectors, but they're not collecting cornflakes. Just in case the penny hasn't dropped, serial really refers to serial killers. The convention episodes also work in some clever comic book crossovers. It falls to us to come up with a suitable replacement for the family man, so we need a new guest of honor immediately, if not sooner. The missing keynote speaker, the family man, is a former policeman who went on a killing spree until being shot dead by John Constantine in Hellblazer. The disappearance of the real boogeyman is another allusion to Swamp Thing. 
He drowned in Volume 2, Issue 44. The boogeyman's dead. He drowned in Louisiana three years ago. What? Number two, finally alive. Fictional characters should pay close attention to whatever's on TV. It's always pertinent. As Jed sits in a room at the convention, the episode Toys in the Hood from the animated series Static Shock is on TV. You know, our sister will be here in a few hours, and I need you to do me a favor and just stay in the room until she gets here, okay? I can't go with you? Oh, no, no, trust me, you don't want to. It's just a bunch of boring grown-ups down there. The episode features Darcy Mason, an android with free will who flees her creator Toy Man, wanting to lead her own life. She promises to love Toy Man if he gives her a new body, modeled after a human girl, but betrays him and runs off again only to melt due to a fail-safe device. She's ready! She's ready! Wait. I'm alive! I'm finally alive! This story closely parallels the Corinthians. He also transitioned into the world of flesh and blood, betrayed his creator in the pursuit of an independent existence, and is destroyed as a result. You're not going back. I brought you into this world to serve humanity, not to feed upon it. Do you know why I do it? So I can taste what it's like to be human. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Sandmen. This looks like a job for? The Sandman. Time I put the pipe to bed. Morpheus isn't DC's first Sandman. In fact, he's the fourth. The first was Wesley Dodds, and the second Garrett Sanford, who was replaced by Hector Hall. Originally, Neil Gaiman had wanted to revive Garrett Sanford's story, but was asked to dream up a new character instead. In the Sandman comics, Hector's story is retconned, so that he only exists within Jed's mind. The Netflix adaptation still includes Hector, but as Lyda's deceased husband in her own dreams. So if you can choose to be here, maybe you can choose to stay. Think about it, we can have the life we always wanted. It's Jed who thinks he's the Sandman, complete with the old school costume. Oh, King of Nightmares, or I'll send you both to Dreamland. No, oh, and Lyda, you're looking at Hippolyta, Wonder Woman's daughter with Steve Trevor. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.